Hi everyone, I'm very, very honored and excited to be here sitting with Anders Sandberg. First of all, Anders, thank you so much for being here with us at our blog Posthumans. Thank you for having me. Oh, so welcome. So I have the pleasure to be again with Anders at this really interesting conference called Envision at Princeton University. Anders is a senior research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. Um, he is uh, uh, also a very well-known transhumanist, and we already had a very interesting conversation on transhumanism and emerging technologies. So again, you can also watch this other interview. Uh, but uh, Anders is, uh, uh, again, a very interesting thinker who is brave enough to go to real far futures. So first of all, let me tell you that his research centers on management of low probability, high impact risks, estimating the capabilities of future technologies, the ethics of human enhancement, and very very long range futures. So again, in the first interview, we talked about uh, possible, um, very possible type of technologies that are being developed right now, mind uploading, cryonics. But again, Anders goes really to the far future, uh, almost to the end of time. And we want to hear more about it. Thank you well, so much. Thank you. Yes. So my current big project uh, is writing a book that I tentatively call Grand Futures. And this is a kind of research project about looking at what are the limits to what intelligent life like humanity can achieve. Mm. So obviously we have a lot of problems right now that we need to overcome. and. Uh, uh, I think the problem here is that I write a lot of things about nuclear war and uh, information hazards and other dangers to humanity. And our entire institute is trying to deal with existential risks. And many people say, oh, that's so depressing. How can you even do that? And the answer is, well, we're really optimistic about the long term future. If we survive and get our act together, the future could be really great. So my project is really about describing how great could it be? Can we measure that by different scales? What can we actually say about the very far future? What can you say about the very far future and how far is this future? So. My approach is very much looking at what the laws of physics uh, limit us to. Now, we don't know all the laws of physics yet, which makes it also philosophically a very interesting thing about how do we reason about domains where we are uncertain about some fundamentals. So I use various techniques to deal with that. And it's a little bit like climate versus uh, weather prediction. So predicting the weather a few months advance is not possible because it's a chaotic, complicated system. Mm -hmm. But we can do pretty decent climate predictions because that's much more a lawful system. And similarly, human society is strongly affected by chaotic processes, human agency, a lot of things that are essentially random, or at least we cannot predict. We don't have any science or knowledge on how to do that. However, we can certainly say that there is a certain amount of energy falling on Earth from the sun, and that's being processed by whatever processes are on the Earth, and it's radiated out into space as waste heat. We can quantify that quite well, and we can say that produces certain limits on what can go on on this planet. So I'm using these methods to speak about where the limits for intelligence go in the really far future. So you asked me how far I can go. And basically, in my book, I start out by thinking about what about future post-scarcity societies? How rich could we become in a material sense, but also in a sense of um, uh, automation? What services could we get if we succeed in making safe AI? Uh, how nice could life be in a relatively materialistic sense? But then that leads to the next interesting question. Can you also do this in a sustainable sense? And what would the end game of sustainability be like? And most people in sustainability studies, they're struggling on making us more sustainable rather than unsustainable. They're thinking in timescales of hundreds of years or thousands of years. Uh, and that is rather short. And my question is rather, is there a form of sustainability end game that would allow a civilization to sit on Earth indefinitely? And it turns out that there probably are methods of doing that. Uh, I can give a kind of existence proof by thinking about totally enclosed greenhouses with hydroponic gardening. That's probably not the right way of doing agriculture, but it looks like one can make a fairly strict argument that this demonstrates that it's possible to be 100% sustainable. Now, we might not want to go down that road, and maybe we will never achieve that, but it seems to be allowed. The really interesting thing is, we also have geophysics that allows us to think about what will the future of Earth be like? Uh, 
So we can notice that in about 50,000 years or so, our current interglacial is going to end. The polar ice caps are going to start expanding back. My native Sweden is going to be all covered by, with ice. And um, that's going to keep on continuing for a few millions of years of ice advancing, staying there for a few hundred thousand years, then retreating for a while with a new interglacial. We can use an archaeological and paleontological record to actually reconstruct that future. It might be, of course, that in the future people say, no way, we're not going to allow this to happen. We're going to take control of the climate and prevent the Ice Age uh, from happening. But it's very useful to look at the base case where nobody does anything to think about it. On even longer time scales, we can consider the habitability of Earth. It looks like Earth's biosphere has about a billion years to go give or take a few hundred millions of years. This is an area where the models are still pretty primitive. The problem is, in the long run, the sun is getting brighter. And this is, again, a very well understood process. So this is not uh, very speculative. The problem is we don't know exactly when that leads to overheating and the carbon dioxide depletion on Earth. The irony is that right now we're struggling with too much carbon dioxide. But in the long run, Earth is going to run out of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because a hotter sun means that more silicates absorb it, which means that the volcanoes are adding a bit of the carbon dioxide, but it's getting removed very quickly. So the plants have nothing to eat. And that means the end of photosynthesis. And at that point, life on Earth is going to have a rather bleak time. Again, we can start considering, could we extend the lifespan of the biosphere? Um, and it seems like it's possible. You could imagine, for example, putting a solar shade between Earth and the Sun. This might sound like an outrageous mega scale engineering project, but you basically only need to add a napkin of material per year between now and a billion years in the future. So you could imagine automated devices that both are self-repairing and adding these napkins. And even if there are no humans around, we might actually gift the biosphere an extra billion years, which raises really interesting environmental ethics questions about, is this a good thing or a neutral thing? And many contemporary environmental ethics concepts, even though we might say that life has value on its own, don't seem to be able to accept the idea that you could actually add extra years to the biosphere. So I'm writing a separate paper about this interesting problem. Yeah. This is very, very interesting. So, of course, I would like to ask a question about the human, uh, because you're talking about millions of years. So, first of all, we don't know if there are going to be, like you said, humans around or not. But if there are going to be humans from an evolutionary standpoint, are they going to be still humans? What do you think of that? What do you think of the evolution that would have happened by then? So, if we imagine that humans survive but we don't do anything transhumanistic. We don't do anything weird. We never try to engineer our genes or anything. We're just living a society like, just like our current one. There's still selection processes going on. Young people being stupid with cars get them killed. They have fewer kids. Over evolutionary time spans, we, we would actually evolve to us being safer drivers which maybe isn't a grand transhuman evolution, but we are going to change. And genetic drift is definitely going to modify. So if we wait a few million years, certainly those humans are going to be pretty different from us, just like we were different from the Neanderthals. And I don't think it's likely that we're going to keep our fingers out of our genome. Some people are going to be messing around with it, whether using advanced methods like CRISPR or just selective breeding. And that is, of course, totally ignoring all the other possibilities about using nanotechnology and, uh, and uh, other advanced technologies to modify us in other ways. So I'm pretty confident that in the long run, we are going to be an utterly different species unless we decide very conscious that, yeah, we are going to remain according to this standard and implement it, which is a really weird idea too kind of forcing ourselves to remain a species that is unchanged, even though the world around us over millions uh, of years would become totally unrecognizable. I don't even think that is a desirable outcome. I'd rather see us branch out into new species. Yeah, and also talking about new species, let's also talk about new spaces. So do you think, of course, again, we're, when we're talking about such a long uh, time mm. range, um, do you think that humans by then would have also be living in different planets? And uh, what do you think of... In the transhumanist narrative, it's called space colonization. Mm. I like to say space migration. Mm. But what do you think, think again of like humans living, inhabiting other 
planet. Mm. In, in the long run, that is the only way of surviving in the long run. Elon Musk is totally right about that one should become multiplanetary, except that he might be wrong about the planet part. This is actually where Jeff Bezos uh, and his uh, version of Gerald O'Neill's classic vision from the 70s, I think is much more right. That Living on a planet has some advantages. It's a self-supporting system, but most of the mass of Earth is just sitting there holding us down. It's not doing anything, it's not supporting life, it's just being rock. You could actually use the mass of an asteroid belt to build habitats that could have a much larger biosphere in the surface. There could be much more life, not just more people. And I think that is actually an ecological niche that if we can achieve that, opens up the universe to us. So. Right now, our ecological niche is kind of hunter-gatherers or uh, agriculturalists. That other ecological niche would be taking solar and the power and asteroid material, converting it to habitats that contain you know, the elements of life and uh, allow us to build more habitats, solar panels, etc. It's basically a new form of ecosystem. And the amount of material that could be turned into life and habitats is enormous. Literally trillions of people could be living in the solar system, not just for a billion years on Earth, but for several billion years until the sun really turn, turns into a red giant. And of course, if you actually can live on asteroid material and turn that into a habitat, you can imagine putting it into motion and moving it to other solar systems. Even if we don't do any grandiose, fast spacecraft moving close to the speed of light, over very long time spans, other stars pass close by. So even if people just jump over in those rare occurrences, we would, within a few billion years, be spread across the galaxy. And of course, if some people actually want to go there faster, spending much more energy and engineering, that seems to be doable. I'd think that moving fast across the Milky Way probably requires you to go fully post-human. It doesn't seem to be very practical to accelerate any habitat that contains a flesh and blood human too close to light speed. For that, you probably want to use artificial intelligence or uploaded minds. So I have a guess that actually no flesh and blood humans are going to directly leave the solar system. It's all going to be our kind of uh, software descendants that colonize and settle the rest of the galaxy. The interesting thing is, once you can move a little bit more than eight light years, you can settle most of the galaxy, because now you can get to most stars. You can, if you can only move a shorter distance, you're essentially stuck in a small cluster of stars. And similarly, once you can move beyond a few million light years, then you can settle all of the cosmic web we can reach. There is an upper limit about 4.9 gigaparsec away, about 16 million, uh, billion light years away, uh, that corresponds to those galaxies that are so far away that we will never catch up with them because of the accelerating expansion of the universe. So there is a limit to how much of the universe we can ever touch. It's finite, except that it contains billions of galaxies. So this is already unimaginably large. And all those billions of galaxies have hundreds of billions of stars. Each of these uh, systems uh, in turn could have a population of trillions, or if they exist as software in, this, in a Dyson sphere, they, they could be a much larger number. So the total amount of beings that uh, could be spreading out from Earth is simply astronomical. Thank you so much, Anders. And on this, I would like to ask you an ethical question. So, and you know, you were thinking you need to be posthuman mm. to go to space. And of course, as a posthumanist, mm. I'm thinking we should also be posthumanist mm. in the kind of mindset that we br bring to space. Uh, because again, if we mm. go with a discolonizing mindset, the same issues that we've seen mm. on Earth where it's going to be mm. spread on, on, on space. Uh, and then we're going to see a war between Mars and the, the Earth. And we've seen the same story going on. So some people say, you know, like we, with all the damage that we've done on Earth, it's not a good idea to mm. go to other planets. How do you feel about this kind of ethical issue of you know, the human history and maybe not only changing the technology to go to space, but also the mindset? Uh, we're definitely changing our own mindset. Uh, in many cases, I think conflicts uh, have erupted because of perceived lack of resources. Now, space is interesting because on one hand, it actually is extremely sparse in terms of resources. Uh, any place on Earth, even the worst desert on the, or the top of the Antarctic ice sheet, is much more rich in resources than uh, 
the average place in space. Yet, if you can extract those resources, you actually have enormously much larger amounts available. So were we to actually be able to fully settle space, resources would actually not really be a reason for conflict. And uh, perceiving scarcity and, uh, is simply, it's an error of mindset. And I do think we will also change our mindset quite a bit. Now, people have been discussing how space changes your mindset. There is this overview effect where astronauts looking down on Earth uh, feel awe and uh, realize I, this is a precious thing we need to preserve and we're all united. But there's also this question, when you look outward, what do you see? And on one hand, uh, you have a somewhat skeptical view expressed by Stanislaw Lem in Solaris, where he says that, yeah, we you must say that we want to go out and meet Valen, but actually we just want more of the same. He doesn't think this is a good thing. He thinks it's a failing of humanity. But you can certainly imagine humans wanting to make the universe more human-like or Earth-like. Just repetition of that. Mm -hmm. Then again, there are always artists and uh, in, in, in the iconoclasts who try to make something different. Then you have a Star Trek vision. And to boldly go where no man has gone before and uh, to seek out new and the species and so on. That is the idea that you want to go out and be changed by the experience. Mm -hmm. Now, which one is going to prevail? Well, most science fiction authors, of course, are very much on the Star Trek uh, side. Uh, despite all the interesting and unfortunate implications, even implicit in that uh, statement about uh, where no man has gone before, etc. But in reality, I think we are going to branch out in attitudes because it also depends on where do you want to settle, for what purpose. So one thing might just be to go out and explore. Another thing might be, I want to use these resources to become uh, something greater. I might want to build myself a Jupiter brain and have a brain the size of a planet and think super deep thought. Or I might just want to survive because I'm worried that my star is going to burn out. And by, by the way, we only have a trillion years left of the Stelliferous era. What about surviving after the stars? Some, uh, some people and beings might say, I'm going to pre prepare for that. While uh, the grasshoppers are kind of singing and dancing around here among the stars, we ants are quietly going to gather mass so we can survive a really long winter in, 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 the, in the eras beyond the stars. I think there is space for quite a lot of diversity here. Indeed, way more diversity than you can probably have on a planet. Because if you're a self-modifying species, and exist in an environment that uh, has enormous amount of resources, that means very few constraints. Very interesting. So, Anders, yeah, there are so many questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, well, the first one is uh, connecting the, our first interview mm. with the second one. So in the first interview, we talked about transhumanism, possible emerging technologies mm. in the present and in the near future. And we talked about cryonics. We talked about cryonics also, for instance, in the case, the fact that you support this as a science and as a personal choice. And we talked about timing, when would you like to be uh, re revitalized? Mm. Also, if you could also choose of a space, would you mm. like to be back on Earth or on another planet? So Earth is wonderful, but I really, I'm really itching to be among the moons of Saturn. Yeah, it might be a bit darker than around here, but wow, the beauty of the rings, the waves, the small moonlets around the rings are setting up ripples across them, causing long shadows. And Titan, with its sand dunes along the equator, where the sand is actually in uh, ice, and the, the weird lakes of methane at uh, the poles, uh, you have moon, uh, moons like in, uh, that are very, very different. Very little uh, of metals as we're used to Earth, but a lot of ices. I think that environment fascinates me uh, tremendously. But I think I don't want to settle for one place. I want to go everywhere. The solar system is already wondrous enough. In many ways, that might be enough for us. But I think I want to see the rest of the galaxy. I want to see Sagittarius A star, the central supermassive black hole. And that's definitely going to require a very post-human body <laughs> to even get close to that. Um, I want to make use of resources in the supergiant uh, accretion disks around black hole, building Dyson spheres to use that energy to think more deeply. But I also want to see other galaxies. I want to see the Milky Way from the outside. I want to see the cosmic web by moving through it. And that is, of course, the things we know about right now. It's very likely, just like we discovered dark matter as a uh, shocking surprise, that there are other aspects of the universe that we're blind to. Really important aspects that we should be exploring it to pursue and then see, what do we do with this? What do we do when we see these revelations about how small sector of the world we previously inhabited? Being just on Earth, that's not enough. 
Thank you so much. And I would like to connect the one more question mm -hmm. between the first interview and the second one. So Anders uh, mentioned that he's writing a book on these topics and we are all looking forward to reading that. Uh, of course, some philosophers would say, well, this is so far in the future that this is science fiction. And we know mm -hmm. that you love science fiction and we talked about that in the first uh, interview. So do you think that this is like SF philosophy or is philosophy or is science or it's all of them? I think there is an interesting overlap. So once upon a time after all, science was natural philosophy. And I think I would probably call my book project natural philosophy because it's both about what we know about the nature of the universe and biology and the computation that tells us something about the ultimate limits of that. But then I want to turn that back and say, what do different philosophical value systems tell us we should be doing with this? And some of them might say we should turn all the universe into happy minds. Others would say, no, it's important to think deep and excellent thoughts or just survive or do a diverse number of things. So I'm exploring this interaction between different forms of value with the physics. But then you get to the practical stuff. Can we, what can we do now? What does this imply next week? In many cases, it means that the, the future looks very glorious and has a lot of value no matter what your system is. So we better make sure it happens. We need to avoid going extinct prematurely. We want to, to ensure that we can have an open future. But in the end, as I told actually some of my favorite science fiction authors when I met them at a conference, at the very least, you are going to get a reference book. If you want to have performance data for wormholes or how to build your own Jupiter brain, this is the book for you. Fantastic. So, of course, uh, we all are waiting to read in that. Uh, we will have to wait a little more because yep. it's uh, 1,000 pages. So it's, uh, it's a lot of the editing that Anders is, is oh doing dear, at the yep. moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a lot of information is going to be very specific. And uh, first of all, again, if you are interested in what Anders is doing, please look uh, in, at his profile. He's, uh, he's a senior research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. And again, he's a very well-known transhumanist. So again, Anders, first of all, Thank you so much for being here with us at our Vlog Posthum. It's been such a pleasure talking to you about all these fascinating topics. Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, this was our second interview about far futures and really far futures. I mean, we're talking about millions of years from now. But we also have another interview with Anders, which is about the present and the near future. So again, thank you so much, all of you, for watching our interview. And Anders, thank you so much. And Princeton for hosting us. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you.